so I just got out of seeing Lupin the Third, the first. This is, in a lot of respects, the first CGI fully, not a lot of respects, this is the first fully CGI Lupin the Third animated film. Um, it is also, so there's that, the sort of Easter egg, the first related to that. It also, the first, this relates to Lupin's great, uh, Lupin's grandfather, the original Arsène Lupin, he whose name we have to be careful about saying it within the work because, you know, that first book it, or those books aren't quite out of copyright everywhere yet. Let me pull up something on here real quick. It is also the last loop on the third film to come out following um, before the passing, unfortunate passing of, uh, well, Monkey Punch, the creator of Arsan Lup uh, Arsan Lupin the Third, the person, you th the character of whom is the main protagonist of this of this anime. And other than that, I need to pull up the Anime News Network or Wikipedia, either one, because I want to check the cast. Because also, I know we recently, um, the Japanese voice actor for okay, so. I thought one of the Japanese voice actors for um, Lupin the Third had passed for not not Lupin, but like one of the other cast members, uh, Jigen, or yeah, the Jigen or um, or uh, Zenigata had passed away recently. I want to double check that. No, so the so this is not the Okay, so Alright, so we haven't had a so this isn't a recast. Um or at least this is this Yeah, um, we're still the we're still on the original Jigen, um, so same cast there, um, but like I, I had a, I had a concern when I was in the theater, like, oh, wait, is this the, is this the last film with with Jigen with, with, with the original Jigen? Like, nope, no, it's Yoshi Kobayashi is still around and kicking, um. He who has been, who has always been the voice of um, Jigen. Like I, they like, had a moment of. No, be still around. We're just good. In any case, um, how would I describe the plot of Lubon the Third, the first? Well, if you were to ask me in an elevator, assuming that I was watching the movie in a movie theater that had an elevator, and, you know, and I was coming out and said, "Oh, hey, you saw the the third, the first movie. How is it? What what's it about?" I said, "Well, you take Loop on the third, you stick him in Raider, stick him in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, or it, it's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade with Loop on the third, and with your." Uh, Cast of Cagliostro style ingenue. It's a it's it's a big greatest hits movie in a lot of respects. Um, complete with like how they do in the opening credits. They they have a clockwork theme to it because the MacGuffin, well, the initial MacGuffin, which actually doesn't stick around too long in the movie. Um, it's kind of overplayed this particular clockwork device. Um. They do, do, do a clockwork motif through the opening credits, and if, and this they do a like one shot. Here's the like, here's your iconic representation of what these characters are in a single shot, so that you get the archetypes before we move into the actual story proper. And it's like, and most of its usual thing, it's like really precise shooting from Jigen. It's um. It's 
you know, Fujiko looking sexy and then firing a machine gun. It's Zenigata running with a whole bunch of cops. It's, um, it, it it's Goemon cutting a bunch of things because oh, okay, it's Koi, I should correct myself. It's Goemon looking stoic and then cutting a bunch of things because the two traits of Goemon and Shikawa, the the six, the thirteenth, are looking comedically over stoic in uh in increasingly absurd situations and also being cut through absolutely every damn thing. Um, but then for Lupin, we have the classic Lupin shot in, in the sense of the spotlight running along the wall with the camera angle that's kind of at a, at a chase angle facing the wall. Like, at, at, at a, I, I've also, I don't have a wall here so I could demonstrate it, but like you have put my, put my the right hand angle here with my camera. Okay, so you have the hand, you have my hand here. Lupin is running this way, like running towards the camera with the spotlight on him and the bullets um, hitting the wall behind him. You know, that Lupin shot. Um, and it, and like they've, they've done various different versions of that on various pr previous Lupin series before this, but not always. And so it felt like with the inclusion of that particular shot, for by doing it in a 3D CG manner, what is a CG manner? It definitely had the sense of behind it of of this is one of the hits. Expect more of those. Not in taking a sense beyond just the like because there's so many different perspectives and takes on Lupin that you can Lupin you can do in an opening credits shot for him if you're going to do okay here's a single shot or pair of shots that represents the protagonist in different trait you there's you could do loop on grabbing on hold of something with the uh grapple like swinging across the ledge or whatever with a grappling hook to steal a prize uh to, to steal a treasure um if we're a single Lupin shot um we could say okay give me one shot that represents Lupin in a in everything you need to know about Lupin in one image. Um, it like that would be the one I would pick or something more like that. Because it also, it would initially like immediately establish the existence of the wrist grappling hook to the audience in the opening credits, um, which it comes up a lot in the movie. But so if you're trying to establish things to the audience very early on, um, important and distinct traits. One of them, like that'd be a good way to go. Lupin is a thief. He uses gadgets and um, to steal things that are difficult to steal. Like that would be the thing I would do. They went for the original Lupin the first, the Lupin the third part one, running alongside the wall shot because that is a greatest hit in terms of nostalgic imagery with the franchise, and we're playing the hits. This is the greatest hit show. It's we're going after it's we're going after a treasure that's connected to the original Arsène Lupin, like a bunch of other previous movies. Um, we're up against the Nazis, be like like a but like Secret of Mamo and a, of some other previous movies before that. Um, we have a clever, intelligent, but naive and um, yeah, kind of but naive ingenue who falls for Lupin and ultimately Lupin has to let her down gently and say, Hey, you can't, you can't make it in the life that I live and leaves her behind while being pursued by, by Zenigata, like in Castle of Cagliostro. Um, like I think when you see this character, like, you know, Oh, this is exactly what this character is like. This is what this character's arc is going to be. She's going to fall for Lupin. She's going to get left behind. We may see her again in a later adventure, but probably she's going to get left behind. That sort of like, like not probably she's going to get left behind. We reckon if you if you've seen any Lupin before, you reckon especially the films, you recognize these particular beats for these particular characters because they're playing the hits. That said, they play the hits well. The animation is very, very wonderfully done. The characters are incredibly expressive. Um, they do a good job of getting across 
the expressiveness of the Lupin crew that you normally see in 2D animation on the various series, um, the various parts, if you will, if you will, but the various Lupin parts, along with even representing and reflecting several comedic gags related to Lupin's movement is swimming in midair when he's chasing at, um, again, another Cast of Cagliostro reference, or how he kind of dodges and weaves and moves around in a very playful manner, um, that he is a very Bugs Bunny character in a lot of respects. And they, it all plays it across very well, and the animation looks fluid and smooth and appropriately stylized um, without getting into too uncanny valley. It, it's also obviously a situation where it's, this is because we're on a motion picture budget and can put the time into this to do it this way. I don't know if they could pull off this level on a TV show budget and have it, like, yeah, just be able to afford it. And I'd certainly, as far as for Loop on the Third Part 5, when that comes out, I'd prefer to watch that. Like, I, I'm assuming that's going to be standard 2D animation, and that'd be the right way to do it. Um, This was a, this was a subtitled release. Um, Japanese voice cast is solid. I've, I've heard all of these act, these, these actors before doing the loop on, doing the voices in part four, in part three and four, or other part, not, not, blah. part six is the new one that's coming out. Part five, parts four and five are the ones that were previously came out and some of them have come in on that. Um, let's see here. Um. Yeah, Kenichi Kurita came in on 1995, so he was in the TV movies. Um, Daisuke Nakajima came in as uh, as um, as Goemon in look at this 2011. So that would probably be. Um, Woman Called Fujiko Mine and Part 4. Um, same with Koichi Yamadira as, uh, as Zenigata. Well, Zenigata's also gotten, well, oh, Zenigata's in the weird situation of having been played live act. I mean, we have had the loop on the third live action. Uh, So, was this film worth taking the time to see in theaters? Yes, I think it was. Not just because I wanted, like, not just because I've been missing seeing movies in theaters. Um, this is a film which I think benefits, like, it looks, it is a big picture in a lot of respects. Um, and I like, and it definitely benefits from being seen on a large screen so you can see all the nice details really well and that sort of thing. But having to sit with the closeness that you have to do with a TV screen or a, a computer monitor. As far as for would this film like would I prefer this film in 2D traditional animation versus 3D? Um that's a good question. And because there are there are a few big spectacle shots in there which look really neat in 3D, but also and would we also and would be really work intensive to pull off in 2D, but in a way that makes me want to see them to a degree in 2D more. Um, one of the things that I picked up on a anime that's coming out this season that I've, I've dropped eventually which was a uh, Nighthead 2047 is the show uses a lot of CG animation for the characters and environments and that sort of thing. And because it's a psychic battle manga or anime that actually really works in the show's favor because you've created physical objects in the environment with geometry and that sort of thing as part of the creating the CG. So it lets you do more for less 
like if you tried to do this for 2D animation, like you you would what you'd probably end up having instead would be like hunks of rock and concrete and masonry and um smaller objects. You wouldn't necessarily see car in that show, you wouldn't necessarily see cars smashed to bits. Um in loop on the third, the first, we get a couple really big property damage moments and some big, some nice fun bits of spectacle with uh, car chase on um, on a freeway. And like some of the bits in there would probably, what might be a bit more complicated to do with. 2D animation than with 3D just because of how you're handling the cars and that sort of thing. And like and the 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 nature of moving objects in a 3D environment as opposed to um car as opposed to the car stuff. Having having seen I'm 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 expressing this poorly, but it's, I guess it's situation like having seen a fair number of like 90s OVAs and that sort of thing where they've tried to do car chase stuff and it's always been a little awkward and in some cases where they're like we don't have the budget to do a proper car chase so we'll just have the car like drive into a tunnel and then we'll cut into the two people reacting to the aftermath where as here like you have you, you have computer created the freeway already and you've already created computer created the cars so the X, so if you're doing extra work, that's related to like the extra work is related to doing crumple physics and damage to the cars, but having them move back and forth and that sort of thing. That I mean, you're still doing render time, and that certainly costs money. Um, like, but it streamlines that aspect of the process because you're not having to have an animator draw every single cell. It still costs money, still requires work but it is manifested in a different way. And otherwise, like, I enjoyed it a great deal. I still think, like, I still am more of a 2D animation primary guy, primarily guy, but this is, if you're going to do, you're going to take a franchise that has been primarily done in 2D SL animation, um, or just 2D animation and adapt it to 3D. This is a good example to point at much better than say something like Apple Seed. I do certainly recommend picking it up. Um, I will probably have in the doobly do notes because the show is the film is now out on physical media. I will have links to where you can get it from Amazon and Crunchyroll. Getting any, as always, getting anything through those links will help to support the show. And next week, I will have another movie, which will be my thoughts on Shang-Chi. Which, because it'll been a week or so, since a couple weeks since the movie came out, I'll get into very light spoilers there, as it ends up in advance, but not anything serious. Since the movie's not out in like Disney Plus or anything yet. But that's next week. Catch you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 